Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Ask Me Anything session with John Fine of Firebrand Ventures as part of our 2020 Startup of the Year Summit. My name is John Guidos. I am the Director of Strategic Operations at Established, which is the company that produces and is behind the Startup of the Year program and summit. I'm also a managing member of our investment group, Established Ventures. And I'm thrilled to be here today with John Fine as I mentioned. So hi, John, how are you? <laughs> good, good. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, we're, we're excited to have you. So uh, during logistically during the session, I'm going to be asking John some questions to learn more about him, his personal history or his, his professional history, his story, and then also fielding questions from the audience. So if you are watching us, feel free to drop your questions in the chat bar. And I will make sure to try and get those over to John to learn about his uh, his investment strategy and so on and so forth. So if you're watching here today and you'd like to participate uh, and join the conversation on Twitter, use the hashtag startup of year and uh, hashtag GEW2020. Now I'm gonna start out by doing a brief intro and then we'll get into the Q and A session. So as I mentioned, John's a founder and managing partner of Firebrand Ventures, a seed stage venture fund uh, prior to founding Firebrand, John served as a managing director of Techstars, a leading startup accelerator with over 40 programs around the world. Uh, while at Techstars, he ran three accelerator programs in Kansas City and invested in 30 startups. John was previously a part of five startups, including one he co-founded. And before uh, Techstars, he spent nine years with United Health Group managing large-scale pr projects, including scaling a business from zero to 1.5 billion with a B per year and 1,500 employees for four, uh, in four years. So that's uh, beyond impressive. Again, I'm uh, honored to be here with him today and let's start to get into it. So I, I have to admit also that I'm very much interested personally in this conversation because I mentioned I'm personally an investor and also a part of established ventures. So I'm uh, excited to learn some tips from the expert. <laughs> so um, so I'll, get to, I'll get into it here with some questions. now. John, you've been both a startup founder and an investor. Can you share a little bit about how you moved from founder to investor and what that translation uh, transition was like? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was I was a, a founder. You know, I was also a part of uh, four other startups uh, where I was a non-founder but early employee, um, and I had worked for five those five startups back to back. Uh, with no break. And that was that was back in the day. So this is like from 97 to 2005. And, and after having done the fifth one, and by the way, none of them were, were home runs. We had a couple singles or doubles, but we didn't, there were no home runs there with those five. And so after the fifth one, I, I, I told my wife, I was like, you know, I just want to get a normal job for a while. And so I got a job with a healthcare company called Prescription Solutions. And that's the business that took me from, from San Diego to Kansas City. And that was that big project that I ran for them. Um, big, you know, uh, scaling a, an operation from scratch, which was an amazing experience. And that was very entrepreneurial, even though it wasn't a startup. Uh, and so uh, I, I ran, you know, these multi-billion dollar projects for prescription solutions. That company got acquired by United Health Group for 8 billion. I started running largest projects for United. Again, multi-year, multi-billion dollar, dollar projects. Started losing my mind because it was a huge, massive corporation and it was very bureaucratic and political and um, a lot of smart people, but I just didn't didn't uh, function very well in that environment. And so uh, I ended up just starting to, to network in the startup community in Kansas City, uh, which was just fortunate timing on my part because it was 2012 and that when the startup community was really taking off here. And, and one thing led to another, got connected to Techstars, and that's how I really started my investment career. It was when I joined Techstars as managing director in 2013, it gave me the opportunity to invest out of the Techstars fund in uh, 30 companies over three years, um, running that accelerator. And that's really, you know, it was like a crash course on, on being a professional investor. So it was great. I bet. That's great. So can you maybe explain to our viewers, um, how Firebrand Ventures differs from maybe other venture groups or what all you specifically, what industry you guys look for and, and companies you invest in? Yeah, absolutely. So Firebrand was born out of a notion that 
there weren't enough sort of straight up pure VC funds between the coasts. Uh, when I was running Techstars, I noticed that there were a lot of very fundable companies in the mid, mid of the US that had to go to the coasts to get funded. And not only did they have to raise from the coast, sometimes they had to move to the coasts. Mm. And that's no good uh, because you have startup communities that are fantastic that are losing great founders just because there, there's, there aren't enough investment dollars there. Sure. And so sure. that was the, the initial sort of inspiration to launch Firebrand. And as we sort of honed our investment strategy, it became really clear that not only did we like to invest in, in founders and in sort of traditionally underserved, underinvested communities, um, even communities like Austin, Boulder, Denver, Chicago, um, they have fewer investors than you would think. And so um, we also started looking at the specific types of founders that we like to invest in. And it became clear to us that uh, trust is a really, really important part of the founder investor relationship. Uh, and so we started, you know, talking about things like we invest in trusted relationships with it, with exceptional founders, really emphasizing um, that we like to even build that relationship with founders before we invest. Uh, and then I, we brought on our, my, my partner, Chris Marks, who's based in Boulder. Um, and, and his, his previous funds, thesis really revolved around authentic leaders and investing in authentic leaders and authentic founders. And that just was fit right in with, with what we'd already been doing. And so those are some of the ways I think that sets us apart. We really operate on a human level. We're not transactional. Um, we like to get really involved and, and help the founders. And at the end of the day, the founders are our customer. Um, and we feel like even just having the founder as our customer, at least between the coasts, I feel like that probably sets us apart a little bit. Sure. And sure. I, have to, I have to ask, and this may be a goofy question, but the name Firebrand, where does that come from, if I might ask? Yeah. Um, so, so the definition of Firebrand is a person who is particularly passionate about a cause, often inciting change and taking radical action. Oh, wow. And so when I, when I realize a lot of people don't, and I actually, I get that question a lot. I actually have that that definition on the back of our business cards oh, nice. because it gets asked it, it, it gets asked so much and so uh once i realized what firebrand meant i was like oh man this is this is right up our alley sure now i have to ask also too another follow-up to what you had mentioned so you said that the the fund is built on relationships and trust which is which is great by the way um do you have any tips or tricks or any ways that you manage that trust or you can scale that I hope I'm asking that the right way, right? That, but as you grow your portfolio, to be able to have those, those, you know, manage those relationships, I guess. Thing, you know, in any relationship, uh, it's it can take it can take a while to to build, but all it takes is one little thing to destroy it. And uh, and so I think it's about being really deliberate about building that trust from day one, and you can only do it through action, right? You can. You can you can talk, you can have awesome, you know, talking points and messaging, but really it takes, it takes action for, and it's a two-way street. Um, you know, for, for us, it means that, you know, we have to walk the walk, right? Like we have to, um, we have to be a huge fan of the founders that we invest in. We have to do what we say we're going to do every single time without fail, be totally transparent and everything that we do and say, uh, no hidden agendas, no fine print. Um, like all of our investment terms are super standard, for example. Um, you know, we're just upfront with everything we do. We're also upfront about the fact that, hey, we're also funded, we need to make money, right? So, you know, sure. we're really upfront about sure. like, the percentage stake that we're going for in the company. You know, if there's anything, any term in any investment document the founders ask about, we make sure to explain why. Uh, that term is in there, but it, even though they're always standard. So I think all those little touch points that I just talked about and all the little conversations that you have with founders, every single one of those touch points builds trust. Sure. And sure. actually trust is easy to scale once you get to the point where, where it's really solid because once it's there, there's really, you don't have to do anything else. You just have to make sure you don't screw it up. Right. <laughs> so, so for us, it's the best thing about it for us is 
we just get to be who we are. You know, we we don't pretend to be anything other than who we are. We if we if we say that we want to invest in authentic founders, we better be authentic ourselves. Um, so we just kind of wear it on our sleeve and. You know, if it's a fit, great. And oftentimes, sometimes it's it's not a fit. There's no connection um, with the founders, and that's okay too. You know, it all works out. Of course, yeah, that, uh, that's all good. I like your style. We'll put it that way. <laughs> so I'm getting some questions here from the audience. So let me get into those, and I hope I'm I hope I ask these correctly. So the first one's pretty easy up to ask, anyways. What verticals get you the most excited today? Um, big fan of cybersecurity. Uh, we have a few of those in our portfolio. Uh, we like fintech. Uh, fintech can be tricky these days because it's uh, there's so many fintech startups out there. You need to make sure that the products are truly differentiated. But do do love the fintech space because there's so much more room uh, for disruption there. You know, def definitely intrigued by um, a phrase that is now overused called future of work. Um, but but definitely intrigued by um, how companies are developing solutions for this sort of new environment we're all finding ourselves in. Uh, some aspects of that environment might be permanent and long term, and so very intrigued with with that as well. Overall, you know, we're we're fairly sector agnostic. Um, we uh, there's some there's some sectors we, sectors we won't invest in. Nine times out of ten, we're going to gravitate towards B two B software because because that's what we know. Sure. Okay. Another question just came in and I, I don't know your, uh, your AirPod may have died. I'm not sure, but the mic's kind of coming out in and out a little bit. So just wanted to give you a heads up, but I have another question. If you can hear me, hopefully um, from Mark, he says, what's your advice for an industry specific marketplace that is launching their MVP where supply problem is solved, but branding to the demand side isn't with limited marketing resources. Can you can you hear me okay? By the way, yeah, much better now. Thank you. Sorry about that. Could you could you repeat that question? Yes. What's your advice for an industry specific marketplace that is launching their MVP where supply problem is solved, but branding to the demand side isn't with limited marketing resources? Well, that's always a challenge with marketplaces, right? Is it's it's really hard to get a balance between the supply and demand. Um, you know, that's, it, it's a case by case situation. It all depends on what sector you're in, uh, what the demand side of your marketplace looks like, you know, who are these people you are trying to, to get onto the platform. I would say, you know, part of it is probably just marketing 101, which is, you know, meeting those, meeting those customers where they are is, is really important. Understanding where they are, understanding their motivations building those, those customer personas is really, really important. Um, and, you know, I, I also think it's important to, to make an honest assessment of, you know, is this, is this a make, make, just making sure that marketplace itself is viable um, as a two-sided marketplace. I think sometime we've seen in some cases, not always, but startups really um, getting excited about marketplaces uh, where only one side is, you know, it's fairly evident how to acquire those customers, but the other side, it's kind of a mystery. Sure. And uh, the only other thing I would say beyond that is run a lot of experiments, run a lot of little experiments. It, it's the best way to figure out uh, how to acquire customers. And you can do that on a small budget, by the way. There's a lot of tools. There's so many tools out there. You don't need a huge digital marketing budget. Um, there's a lot of experience you can use with existing tools that are out there. No, all, all good, uh, good words of advice. So I have some questions here too. And I want to have a little bit of fun with this and don't feel, you know, I don't want to give away any secrets here or anything, but you know, what, what do you, what do you feel are your most successful investments? And then the second part of that is, are there any deals that came across your plate that looking back on it, you kick your kick yourself that you really wish you would have invested in at the time. Yep. Yep. Um, so, you know, some of the success, most successful investments we have, uh, one of them is a FinTech company um, that, that, uh, that does programmable ACH transactions. Another one is uh, 
a cybersecurity company that deals with endpoint security. Mm. Um, and they've, they've grown quite well. Um, so, and again, we, we continue to be really excited about cybersecurity. Uh, another one is a data analytics company that uh, uh, tracks the movement of goods and people within cities and states and, and packages up that data and, and markets it to, to municipalities and states um, to help them plan for their, the building out of their own infrastructure. Um, and then we have one or two e-commerce companies that are doing quite well in this economy, um, mm -hmm. especially with COVID and people buying so many more uh, goods online. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's a, we have a fairly diverse portfolio um, for, again, for us, it, you know, in the beginning, it always comes down to the founders, always comes down to the team. Uh, we over in index on the team by far. Um, and that's, uh, so far that's served us pretty well, knock on wood. And then, um, deals that, that, uh, sort of are, are anti-portfolio, like deals that we wish we would have done, but we didn't do, you know, we're still fairly early on. So that I think that the jury is still out, you know, we're four years in, you know, one of them, I guess. I'm sure they've struggled a little since COVID, but I'm sure they'll come back. Is a company that uh, they they sell basically like these packages of of um, items that uh, rideshare drivers can sell to their to their riders. Mm. And when we first met them, they were really really early. So it's like you know you're talking about like candy bars and like knickknacks sure. and like things like that. Well, when I first met them, they were in Accelerator, and uh, you know, their, their prototype was, was terrible. Right. And, and I, and it was my fault because I couldn't visualize what it could become. I was just looking at their prototype, which it was like a couple of Snickers bars, like in one of these plastic, like travel <laughs> cases. Right. Uh, why, how are you ever going to sell this to drivers? Like, you know, I just didn't get it. And the bottom line is they, it, it took off before COVID it took off. Oh wow! And and they raised some, a really big round from I, a, a top tier VC. Again, I'm sure they've 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 taken a hit, but uh, you know I've no doubt they'll come back. And so that's that's one that uh, I failed to visualize, mm. uh, and, and you know that that was my fault. Sure, it sounds like you have a nice assortment of of portfolio companies, and I personally always. I like the tech enabled service companies that aren't necessarily the most exciting companies, but when you look at some of their metrics or KPIs, you know, it, it, they just, they get me excited anyways, <laughs> even though I'm usually the person at the table that everyone else, else disagrees with for some reason. But uh, you brought up, you brought up a good point there about, you know, investing in the founders. So let me ask you, what characteristics do you look for? Do you value most in the founders that you talk to that, that, that pitch to you? Yeah, uh, basically like being authentic right off the bat, right? Being authentic, transparent, honesty, integrity, uh, just putting it all out there. You know, I think in, in some cases, and maybe this is more evident in Silicon Valley than other places, but um, I, I think some, some founders are sort of advised that fundraising is a game mm -hmm. and you want to game the system as much as possible, be super transactional, get the highest valuation, doesn't matter from who, uh, you know, those types of things. Um, we're really the opposite of that. You know, we look for founders who want to build a relationship, um, who, who value the relationships with their investors, just like they do with their mentors or advisors, and are really obsessed, you know, are really obsessed with solving a big problem in a better way. Um, I think it's, it's easy it's not easy, but it's it's relatively easy to be different uh, with your product, your solution. It's really, really hard to be different and better. Mm. And and so you know, we love founders who think about that in a creative way and are incredibly just obsessed in not an unhealthy way, but 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 very obsessed and driven because we also believe that we've gone through startup life ourselves as founders we know how much of a, an emotional roller coaster it can be. And you need that fire, that obsession, more than passion, I think. You need that obsession to, to drive you and just get through that every day. Uh, and, and a lot, so much of startup success and founder success is persistence. Right. And just, you know, there's so many, you know, look at all these stories we have these, of these, you know, 
incredibly successful companies that were on the brink of failure over and over and over again. Uh, and that's, that's more common than the opposite of, you know, of just a smooth ride upwards, but the founders figured out a way to power through. And it's, it was almost always because they were obsessed. And so um, those are some of the things that, that we look for. There's a long list, but uh, probably those are the top ones. Great. So I have some more questions coming in here from the chat. So let me get to those here. Um, what do you think about the future of e-commerce and what trends are you seeing in 2020 uh, that'll be going into the, the new year? Yeah, that's a great question because, you know, it's very tricky right now for e-commerce. Um, so you may, I'll, I'll just give you an example. So first of all, e-commerce has done amazing since COVID. More people are home, more people are shopping online. They're not going to stores. Maybe they're a little bored <laughs> and they're doing some, you know, impulse shopping. I don't know, sure. but, uh, but it, you know, it's been, it's, ta it's gotten sort of this artificial bump. And so now the question is, what is it going to be like in 2021? Um, you may have noticed the public markets the last few days have been rallying. Uh, the Dow has been rallying, but it's a, it's a, it's a different type of rally that's happened. They're rallying on the news of these vaccinations. Uh, maybe there's some more stability in the White House, uh, whatever the case, but it's, a, it's more of a post-COVID rally. It's not that we're post-COVID, it's that the market's looking forward to that. Well, in these rallies that have happened, um, Amazon, the biggest e-commerce company in the US, has gone down. Their stock has gone down during that rally. So, so the question is, will the e-commerce sort of rally that's happened so far that should be able to continue into next year? My guess is it will gradually go back to pre-COVID levels. Um, having said that, I think if you have, you know, an amazing, an amazing product or amazing platform that is that is e-commerce based, it's always going to be successful in any market. We just think that it's uh, tricky right now to forecast how, you know, how the how the sort of in COVID and versus post COVID markets are going to affect e-commerce. And, and my guess is they'll, they'll probably uh, revert back to the mean a little bit more. Sure. Makes sense. T uh, 2020 has just been in general, I think, hard to forecast. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but anyways, I got another question that came in here. Um, as an investor, how would you prioritize the following? Uh, your team, I'm sorry, the, the company's team, the portfolio company team, uh, product, traction, and TAM, total addressable market. Yeah, uh, team, team's way, way up there. So if like, if it was a visual, the team would be like way, way up here at the top. And then, you know, we probably the next one down, um, would be would be product. Um, we really like to dig in on the product. Um, traction is maybe a close close one right after that, and then probably the TAM is last for us. And and the reason why that is is because um, markets change, markets mm -hmm. shift. Yes, we have to love the market um, of any company that we invest in, um, but oftentimes it's not even necessarily the market that is today. It's we what we believe the market will be in the next three, five, seven, 10 years. Sure. Um, but yes, team is what makes everything go. Uh, we are not the type of investor to invest in a company and think, ah, you know, we love the product of the market and, and maybe we'll, you know, we'll replace the CEO or maybe we'll replace this person, this person. That's just not our business. We don't do that. Um, so we have to really have extremely, extremely high conviction in the team. And by the way, the product, the traction, and the market are all a reflection of the team anyway, and how they're thinking about all those things. And so to us, that's, that's you know, our, our North Star is always comes back to the team. Right. So I have to ask this because a lot of our audience out there are startup founders that are looking, you know, to uh, grow and scale their business. And then also a lot of them are raising capital, which is a full-time job these days, it seems like. So what um, what tips do you have for startup founders that are pitching to investors out there? I'd say first and foremost, and this is not easy, I recognize, because I've been in this position myself many times. Do the very, very best you can and iterate on your message so that you can communicate to the investor what you do in a clear, concise, and compelling way. 
it's really, really hard to do. Um, I can tell you that most founders aren't quite there yet. There are, but if you can do that, that almost like puts you, that almost like gives you an advantage just being able to do that and be super, super clear about what you do. What are your two to three top value props? You know, what really sets you apart? Two to three bullets. That's it. Not not like a verbal paragraph. Just just right to the point. Why is your team the team to do this? Your team does not have to all be from from Google and Amazon and Facebook, whatever. That that's not a requirement. And by the way, you don't have to be from an Ivy League school either. But you do have to communicate why your team is the right team to do this and why the right time to do this is now. And and so really honing in on those things. Um, and being super, super clear and concise is it really goes a long way. One thing I would tell founders is don't try to like tell your life story or the life story of the company in your, in your first pitch, even your second pitch. You want to get the investor interested. You want to get them intrigued. It's almost like a job interview. You want to get the next meeting. And so just hit them with the high points, hit them with the most compelling story that you can and stay away from words like, we think we can do this, our plan is to do this, you know, eliminate all tentative words from your vocabulary and be like, this is what we are going to do. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. Like that, that's another thing I think that really, um, really helps to inspire confidence with, with investors. Sure, well, I have about, 10 pages more <laughs> of questions, but I need to do the, the audience here justice and ask them. I have some more questions rolling in. So um, one question here is we are a healthcare technology company. Our solution is applicable to COVID as one disease, but we do not want to be labeled or shown as a COVID company. When contacting investors, how much weight should they put behind, between, behind being a COVID company uh, versus the, the other. Yeah, I think it's a smart, it's, I think you're, they're thinking about it the right way. And it, there is a risk to just being pigeonholed as a COVID company. Um, we don't know what the vaccines are gonna look like next year, but clearly they're coming out. Um, there's gonna be a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, so I think it is important uh, to, to have both parts of the story in there. Sure. And so one example that might be, hey, look, phase one, we're, we're we're taking advantage of this COVID situation. We think we can add value here, here, and here and start to build the foundation of our business. Phase two, we're gonna be, we're gonna be taking that growth and leveraging it to, to attack this in our phase two. I think that is a, a completely valid story. I think it's a good, it's a good sort of jumping off point um, to use COVID, you know, the, the COVID opportunity for that, but it, but it doesn't pigeonhole you to be a COVID related company forever. Sure. And, you know, we're running out of time here, but how, what are your, and for our investor uh, attendees that may be watching, what are your thoughts on some of these other strategies that differ from your historic, uh, historical VC uh, type of investments, right? Like uh, revenue-based investing or crowd-based investing. What, what are your thoughts on some of those that are kind of emerging lately? Uh, my attitude is, hey, man, like whatever gets startups funded, you know, <laughs> we're we're fans of entrepreneurs, whether we invest in them or not. And I so, for example, I have a, a really close friend of mine here in Kansas City. Um, he runs a, a revenue based fund, and I think it's awesome. So so I think the more the merrier, as long as they're good investors. Right. As long as they're they're They, you know, they're, they're good actors. They're good faith players in the system. And uh, they're, if they're putting more capital in and, and giving founders, you know, a better chance by giving them alternatives, I think that's awesome. I like that answer. That's great. Um, so, John, lastly here, is there a way that people, you would prefer them to connect with you if, uh, if applicable? Yeah, plenty of people connect with me on Twitter. Uh, and so my, my handle is, is at, is at John Fine, J-O-H-N-F-E-I-N. -E uh, they can always reach out to me there. Fantastic. Well, that really concludes our ses session. John, this was amazing. I learned a lot and I really appreciate your time. All of us here at Establish do as well. 
um, want to thank you from, you know, genuinely, we really mean that. Um, and for those of you that are still watching here, we have a few more sessions today. You can either jump over and watch the top 100 uh, startups pitch, or you can attend another Ask Me Anything session with uh, mindfulness expert Ash Kumra from Peak Mindful, uh, amongst other activities that we, and we have a lot going on the next couple of days. So signing off for now, John, thanks again. And thank you all for uh, tuning in here today. Thanks for having me.